Hello, everybody. This is Harmon Hart. I uh, promised y'all a while back I would do a little series on two-stroke engines and reliability and how to keep them flying without um, having engine problems. And um, I, I'm going to do that this morning. I thought I'd start out with a little two-stroke theory for those of you who may not uh, uh, know about that. Uh, I'm by no means an expert on two-stroke engines. Uh, I've just been around them my whole life, and so I, I know a little bit more than most. But a, a two-stroke engine, everybody hears two-stroke engines and four-stroke engines. A two-stroke engine, uh, basically, for every every time the piston moves up or down, that's considered a stroke. So if the piston moves down and back up, the spark plug will fire, and that's a power, and, th and then it pushes the piston down under power and that's a that's your power stroke and then it goes down to the bottom comes back up and it fires again so every time the piston goes down and up which is two strokes it fires a four stroke engine like in most cars it has to it has valves and so it has four cycles of the piston so we're going to we're going to concentrate on the two stroke engines now four stroke engines have crankcase oil usually and they're lubricated with that but a two stroke engine has to be lubricated somehow or it would overheat and so the way that um, they're designed is usually they have some sort of mixed gas or oil in the gas and it can be pre-mixed where you pour the oil in the can and then put the pre-mixed gas into your tank. Or you can have a gas tank and an oil tank and it can oil inject. Either way, it's the same. It, it, it accomplishes the same thing. Um, now, when there are different designs of two-stroke engines, and, and there's a bunch of them. The most prominent ones are piston port, rotary valve, and reed valve. And the, this little Rotax 503 that you're seeing in the picture here is what you call a piston port engine. This carburetor intake right here does not go directly into the cylinder like you would really think it should. It, uh, when, when this thing sucks ga air and gas in, it goes under the piston and is forced around through the crankcase to lubricate the bearings. And then it goes back up what they call transfer ports. And those transfer ports take the mixture from the crankcase through the side of the cylinder and back up on top of the piston. And then when the piston goes up, it compresses that mixture. The spark plug up here fires and it forces the piston back down. And so um, a rotary valve would have a plate right here with a rotary valve that has a pie-shaped wedge in it. Then when the, when the rotary valve spins, it lets the air in and it kind of does the same thing. It's a lot more efficient than a piston port motor and it makes a lot more power but it's also additional complexity and additional maintenance and additional wear. And so the piston port air, airplane engine, the little two-stroke engine, is just a very simple, simple, reliable motor. Uh, because this is lubricated with gas and oil, uh, all that needs to go through your carburetor here. If the, if the gas and oil doesn't go through the carburetor, if you have, say, a crack here in this rubber boot, or if you have a seal on the end of the crankshaft back here inside or in the front or in the front up here and uh, it allows air to be sucked in that doesn't have gasoline mixed with it with oil then you get a lean condition and that can cause a, a piston seizure okay uh, if you have the wrong jetting in your carburetor if you have clogged jets if you fuel starve there's a, a lot of different things that can cause a lean burn condition and a, and a seizure because of that and that's a whole science in itself reading pistons and learning what caused them to to burn up but for now i'm going to try to keep this pretty simple okay so what you want to do is you want to make sure that you start out with a good engine okay new there's a compound these are the two case halves there's a compound they put in there that acts as a gasket. You want to make sure that you've got a good engine that isn't sucking air in through the gaskets or the seals. And once you do that, then you can set the carburetors accurately and you can rejet these bings. Now, there's all kinds of information on the internet on how to, how to jet a bing carburetor. They're very simple. They're very old. They've been around forever. And Rotax has a jetting chart for your altitude compensated for. And all you have to do pretty much is be able to read it and follow directions. And if you, if you do a little research, you can learn to jet your own carburetor. It's not really rocket science. Um, so what goes wrong with these little engines that seem so simple? Well, 
almost in every instance, it's something related with fuel, okay? It's almost always something related with fuel. Every now and then, you'll have a catastrophic failure of a bearing or a rod or something like that. And most of the time, that's related to a lean condition, which can be traced back to your fuel. And so what causes those kinds of problems? Well, the, uh, the number one cause for, um, you know, I would say uh, is, is bad gas. You know, people let these things sit for months at a time. And if you're using this new gas with ethanol in it, uh, you're just asking for problems. I don't use that stuff. I use Avgas in this one, 100 LL. And, yeah, it causes a little lead buildup, and the spark plugs don't last quite as long. But it also um, doesn't give you near the problems that ethanol fuel gives you. And so I stay away from it. Um, but a clogged fuel filter, alcohol in the gasoline, uh, uh, old fuel, that, that's really a horrible thing for airplanes is old fuel because airplanes don't fly a lot usually. They sit for months at a time, sometime during the winter. And that fuel goes bad. Well, you don't want to, you know, a lot of people are too cheap and they just say, oh, I'll just burn it up this tank and I'll put some fresh in. That's the wrong, that's the wrong way to think about that. You, you wouldn't feed yourself food that was past the expiration date. Don't do that to your airplane engine. Drain that fuel, dispose of it, and put fresh fuel and oil mix into the uh, tank. Um, the other thing is uh, inadvertent uh, mixture leaning at, uh, at idle. And that could be from carb ice, a couple of different reasons for that. Um, engine warm-up and shock cooling. And the air filters being clogged. Okay, if you've noticed that almost everything I've read you here, almost every item is completely preventable if you just maintain this little engine. If you clean these air filters every so often, and you can look at them and tell when they need to be cleaned, they're reusable. You soap them down, you wash them out, you re-oil them, and you put them back on. If you change your your fuel filters regularly, if you change your fuel line regularly every couple of years when it needs it, if you change this pulse port line right here and that comes out of your engine, if you change these hoses regularly, the chances of one of them breaking are very, very slim. However, if you allow them to deteriorate and crack and become hard, the chances of them breaking are very, very good. If this pulse port line breaks, it's a, it's a direct line into your engine for air to go in and cause a lean condition and a failure. So you just have to make sure that all that stuff is really well maintained, okay? Really well maintained. Um, this fuel pump, this pulse port, because the engine, the piston goes up and down, um, that creates a pulse of a vacuum, and that is used by this little fuel pump to pump your fuel. These little fuel pumps are supposed to be mounted horizontally like this one is, okay? I see them mounted vertically, and yes, you can do it, but it's not recommended. You're supposed to mount them horizontally, okay? Um, as far as uh, fuel systems go, that's going to be another video. I have a real good fuel system on this little plane, and I'll share it with you, but I don't want to run this video too long. So um, let, let's just go over uh, one of the other major problems that I see people doing, and that's, um, it's called a cold seizure or shock cooling, okay? And it's the same exact thing, it's just done two different ways. If you turn this little engine over and it starts and you immediately gun it to full throttle and hold it there and you don't allow the parts to warm up, the piston is going to grow Metal expands when it gets hot. That piston is going to grow faster than the cylinder walls, and it's going to eventually expand to the point where it's going to stick in the cylinders, and it's going to, call, it's going to cause what they call a cold seizure. Cold seizures are 100% avoidable. All you have to do is start this little engine up and let it idle and warm it up for three to five minutes. That's all you really need to do to prevent a cold seizure. Now, shock cooling is, uh, a, a, is a form of cold seizure, and this is the one that would worry me more than the, the warming up of the engine. When you're coming in on final, if you have this little motor idling for a long period of time, being a fan-driven engine, it's going to cool up cylinder heads and cylinders down. And if you have a sudden go-around, if you have a go-around and you firewall this thing, you're basically doing pretty close to the same thing as starting it up uh, 
cold and gunning the throttle full speed. And so you want to avoid doing that by just leaving a little bit of throttle in when you're coming in to make your descents. You, you carry a little bit more speed, which probably doesn't hurt anything anyway. And that way, if you and hopefully I'll have that done pretty soon. Thanks for watching.